Um, so the two speakers that we have today are uh, have joined the Moran uh, recently. So Monica joined last year and Stefan started working with us this year. Uh, first speaker will be Monica Fleckenstein, uh, who was originally a professor at the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Bonn, uh, where she also had, um, had the clinical trial center. Uh, she's an MD, PhD, and she's, um, um, through her work, has been involved in many clinical trial. Uh, she's made uh, several major contributions to AMD research, and probably um, she's probably most known for her contribution to understanding um, the phenotypes associated with geographic atrophy. Um, she, um, she's won, well, many awards. <laughs> um, and she um, moved to Utah primarily to lead uh, the DREAM study, which is a, a prospective study designed to understand the natural history of AMD better. Um, so, well, I look forward to hearing it from talk. Thank you, Musa. Good morning, everyone. So our main headline today uh, for both of us is AMD Revisited. And uh, I would like to um, show you some other phases of AMD. These are my financial disclosures. I would like to start with the familiar phases of AMD. So we all know the different manifestation, early intermediate AMD that is characterized by drusen, by hyperpigmentation on OCT. We see dome-shaped elevations. We see hyperreflective foci associated or correlating with hyperpigmentary changes. We know the late stages, choroidal neovascularization and geographic atrophy. Choroidal neovascularization, as we know it, or how is the common um, opinion is that we have exudative choroidal neovascularization. The exudation is visible in intraretinal or subretinal fluid. We see from time to time hemorrhages in the fundus. And this is an angiography uh, where you see this uh, choroidal neovascularization. Geographic atrophy is characterized by loss of the outer retinal layers on OCT. And um, fundoscopically, we see a lesion where the choroidal vessels shine through. And we ha um, this is mainly hypopigmented. And with fundus or fluorescence imaging, these lesions can be really nicely delineated. So fundus or fluorescence imaging allows for visualization of uh, fluorophores. And these are mainly located in the RPE. And uh, if there's loss of RPE, we have a decreased fundus autofluorescence signal, and this is why fundus autofluorescence imaging is used in the diagnostics of geographic atrophy. I'm still fascinated by the different phases of geographic atrophy visualized by fundus autofluorescence imaging. And um, fascinating about this is um, this high degree of symmetry between the right and the left eye in patients, not only of the shape of the lesion, also of this pattern surrounding the atrophic lesions. But it's also fascinating that we have a large variety of different phenotypes in geographic atrophy. And if we take a closer look, we see that some patients share the same phenotypic manifestation like these, for example, or these two patients. Usually we say geographic atrophy or the dry late stage of AMD is slowly progressive. But I would like to highlight here that these different phenotypes behave differently in regard of the disease causes. So we have phenotypes that progress quite slowly, but we also have phenotypes with an aggressive progression. And I would like to draw your attention in the next minutes to this really aggressively progressing form of geographic atrophy, which is called trickling geographic atrophy. So what, is, uh, what are the characteristics of this trickling geographic atrophy? As mentioned before, we have an extremely fast disease progression. I think the mic is not working anymore. 
Um, and uh, characteristic is also that we have this lobular configuration of the atrophic lesion as compared to non-trickling geographic atrophy. On, fundus, on OCT imaging, there is a striking finding in these patients. We have a so-called splitting of band four in OCT. Yeah. Coming back to OCT trickling. <laughs> So um, the striking finding of this splitting. So there's obviously material in between Brooks membrane and the RPE, and maybe this is related to this extremely fast progression of this phenotype. And compared to other non-trickling geographic atrophy, you see here an irregular border, but you do not see the splitting of this band four that is obvious in this phenotype. Another interesting finding in this phenotype is that the choroid is significantly thinner as compared to other GA phenotypes. So these are two um, examples here. You see highlighted the choroid. And this is um, an analysis with uh, several patients with trickling and non-trickling geographic atrophy. And you see there is a significant difference in choroidal thickness. And if you compare both groups to control eyes, so eyes without AMD, you also see a significant difference in choroidal thickness. So obviously, this phenotype uh, goes along with a rarefication or a thinning of the choroidal vasculature. Um, what we saw additionally in these patients was that they are younger when they present the first time. Um, and um, so their age uh, of onset appears to be younger than other geographic atrophy patients. And of course, we talk to our patients, we ask them about comorbidities, and um, we realized that there was a weird change in the proportion of male when we looked at different ages of these patients. And this is highlighted in this graph. So these are these trickling geographic atrophy patients with an age younger than 65. And we had more than 50% male in this age group. When we looked at the older trickling patients, we had a significant decrease in the male proportion. So when we compared it to other geographic atrophy patients, where the proportion of male was about 40%, there was this significant shift in the male proportion with age. And um, when we again thought about what the people, what the patients told us, uh, we realized that there was an interesting finding, and this was that more than 50% of these patients told us that they had already been hospitalized due to cardiovascular diseases when they were younger than 65 years. And um, men actually told us that, um, or more than one third of the male patients told us that they already had myocardial infarction in the ages younger than 65. So taking these findings all together, um, we speculate or we hypothesize that this, this significant decrease in male proportion with age in this specific phenotype is due to an increased mortality in men. And that degenerative retinal, um, this, that this is a degenerative retinal disease that is mainly caused by vascular changes so that there's a primary vascular pathogenesis. By the application of OCT and geography, and these are preliminary findings, um, this examination actually underscored this hypothesis. When we take a closer look to um, OCTA, so these are slabs at the, um, at the level of the choroid. We see in this trickling a phenotype, a rarification of the choroidal structure as compared to other geographic atrophy. So this is within the geographic atrophy lesion, but this is also rarification outside the atrophic lesion that you do not see that obvious in other GA phenotypes. Now I would like to come to another type of vascularization, not the 
original choroidal, uh, uh, choroidal vascularization, but the choroidal neovascularization. And I would like to share with you uh, the images of this patient. So on OCT, we see a separation between Brooks membrane and the RPE, and we see some subretinal fluid. Um, on fundus imaging, we see some areas with geographic atrophy, and on fundus fluorescent angiography, we see window defects in these areas of geographic atrophy. And after almost five minutes, there is not really an obvious exudation or leakage in, these, in this patient. We may see some staining, maybe a little bit of leakage, but it's not really obvious. So this patient appears to have a non or minimally exudative form of choroidal neovascularization. By application of OCT and geography, we can actually detect this choroidal neovascularization that is obviously non-leaky or only minimally leaky. Actually, two years ago, I treated this patient with anti-VEGF therapy, and we see a decrease in the subretinal fluid here. To be honest, today, I may wait with treatment because we learned that first, subretinal fluid might be not that harmful in AMD. And secondly, we also see that this subretinal fluid may disappear without any treatment. But there was a successful um, reaction after treatment, and um, actually this was the only treatment in this patient, and we followed up on this patient for many years without any recurrence of exudation. This is another patient. Um, on OCT, again, we see a lesion at the level Brooks membrane and RPE. The color fundus image does not show any significant changes. On fluorescent angiography, we see a stippled change, and ICGA shows a lesion, but it's also not really clear um, what is going on in this area. And again, by application of OCT and geography, and this is colored actually, this small lesion, we can detect a small choroidal neovascularization, but obviously this is again not exudative. We didn't treat this patient. And this is the follow-up of this patient over seven months, and it becomes obvious baseline, one month, four months, seven month, there is, this, this lesion is not harmful, it's silent or quiet, how these CNB lesions are called today, actually. Another patient, we saw her for many, many years, and these are the images of 2019. And um, again, you see this lesion or this it's also called the double layer sign. So you see Brooks membrane and the RPE on top of it. FA again does not really show us leakage. On ICGA, we get an impression that there is a lesion, but again, OCTA is really nicely demonstrating us that this actually is a choroidal neovascularization but again, without exudative activity. And going back in, um, in the history of this patient, so we saw her for many, many years. This is 2015. We didn't have OCTA in this time. This is 2013. This is 2011. So obviously, these lesions are there. They do not really change. She's from a family with sisters and cousins with severe AMD, and she was the one not progressing. Her vision was in 2019, still 2020. And she was never treated in this eye. <coughs> now I would like to come back to geographic atrophy. And um, this is actually a cause of GA that we know, or that is familiar, 
we see a progression of these atrophic lesions over time. So this is a time um, of six years and we see a marked progression of this atrophic lesion. This is a patient also with a tiny area of geographic atrophy and this is also a follow-up of six years. And interestingly, this lesion did not really progress over all of this time. And the question of course is, what is the difference here? Why is this patient, this area, and this second patient not progressing? And here again you see this double layer sign and by OCT and geography you can detect beneath this area of geographic atrophy that there's again a non-exudative choroidal neovascularization. And uh, taking these observations all together, um, we had the hypothesis that non-exudative A and D may or is a strong prognostic marker for a decreased geographic atrophy progression. And uh, we asked the question, um, is this type of CNV maybe protective and protects and saves the RPE and photoreceptors? And um, to analyze this um, more systematically, we um, performed an analysis in the context of the pro prospective neutralization <coughs> DSGA study. And uh, we included um, 98 eyes of, 90, uh, of 59 patients. Um, 81 of these patients had pure geographic atrophy. Seven of these eyes had geographic atrophy and treatment naive, non-exudative CNV. And 10 eyes had RPE atrophy with a history of exudative CNV. So this means these were patients that had minimally active CNV and had been treated in the past. We had a follow-up time only of 1.17 years. Um, we performed uh, multimodal imaging in these patients, including OCTA. And uh, our primary outcome was the odds ratio for reduced geographic atrophy progression in presence of occult or type 1 CNV. So these are the CNV lesions located between the uh, between Brooks membrane and the RPE. And these are two patients um, I would like to show you. Um, so actually, um, we also included historical data in these patients. So we went back in um, the history of these patients and looked at the images before the era of OCTA imaging. So this is the one patient I showed you before. So we have this small atrophic lesion here. This is fluorescent angiography in 2011. We have a double layer sign here and we try to delineate what we would think there was already a CNV lesion. And this is actually seven years later. Again, the atrophic lesion did not progress and on OCTA we clearly saw there is a um, non-exudative CNV lesion and again here you have this double layer sign. So we suspect that this lesion was already there seven years before and that this maybe had protected the RPE and photoreceptors uh, in regard of um, degenerative changes. This is another patient. You see a small atrophic lesion here in 2014 and we again tried to delineate what we thought what was the area where CNV was already presented this year. You again see a double layer sign here, so splitting between the Brooks membrane and RPE. And in 2018, there was progression of this atrophic lesion, but when you delineate in OCTA the area of CNV, you see that it's more in this area here, the direction of the spread of GA was more pronounced in the opposite direction, and that the spread of atrophy in the direction of the CNV region was slower. Herein I would like to highlight how we did the analysis. So this is again a patient with a foveal sparing actually and a, a, with a CNV lesion exactly beneath this foveal sparing. 
And uh, what we did here, and actually I would like to mention Maximilian Pfau, who did the heavy lifting <coughs> in this analysis. Um, at baseline, we delineated the uh, C and V lesion, and then we analyzed the um, spread of geographic atrophy in the future. So these, this was the prospective part of this study. And uh, so um, in this patient, and this is an orthogonal representation of the spread of geographic atrophy, we see in the area of the CNV lesion, there was only minimal spread of the geographic atrophy lesion. So taking these observations together, um, and um, taking together all the results of our analysis, um, we showed or we could see that there is reduced probability of GA progression in presence of non-exudative CNV, um, odds ratio of 0.21, and also in the presence of exudative, ex exudative occult CNV, there was also a reduced probability of GA progression. And so this raises again the question, and um, this hypothesis is not new, and this is the revisited part. <laughs> this had brought forward decades ago, I mentioned Dick Green, the Sarks, Hare, CNV evolution, maybe, or there is obviously a protective, this is obviously a protective mechanism to save RPE and photoreceptors. Maybe not in all types of CNV, but I think this is a piece um, in um, AMD that needs to be further investigated. And I would like to summarize the first part of the grand rounds. Um, differential clinical appearance and disease course may help to identify distinct AMD manifestations or let's say other AMD phases. Um, we saw the trickling AMD phenotype with an extremely rapid GA progression and uh, there is rarification of the choroidal vasculature in this phenotype and the question is, is there maybe a generalized vascular deficiency in these patients given this high comorbidity of cardiovascular diseases. And on the other side, another phase, the non or minimally exudative CNV lesions with a decreased AMD progression. And um, maybe there is a protective mechanism to save RPE and photoreceptor. And this is actually what we would like to focus on in the next years, and we really hope to collaborate with all of you on this um, in general, the role of vascularization in AMD progression. I thank you for your attention. So, Monica, <clears throat> I love it. It's fascinating. Uh, two questions that come to mind. And um, in regards to the uh, non minimally exudated CNV, so, so uh, obviously many people would treat that. And so do we have enough data to suggest if you do treat it and eliminate that, then do you increase the risk of, of uh, do we have evidence to show that you do increase the risk that uh, this, this GA is gonna increase more rapidly? So you eliminate the protection, is it gonna get worse? Which, which would, the hypothesis would suggest that that had to be the case. Do we have evidence for that yet? So this is one of the main questions, of course. Right. And um, Paul, are you aware we really have evidence if we would increase GA progression? So there's data out, they show there's no increased GA progression when you treat it hard. Um, but there's also data out that shows there's an increased progression. I don't know, Paul, what, what do you think? It's, it's controversial still, and it just, I, I would just kind of wonder in thinking about this, is there a difference in response? Are these more res these kind of subclinical ones, are they more, more resistant to anti-VEGF than the active lesions that we're seeing? And I don't know. But it's a question that. certainly has to be answered. That, that's a, I mean, obviously it's protective. You want to leave it alone. And that, that's, a, that's not been the general mindset. The other one is, uh, so we're looking at, at, at phenotypes. The genotype is fascinating. Is the trickling more commonly associated with homozygous risk of chromosome 10, or do we know that yet? So, uh, of course, we <laughs> started analyzing this. Um, we would have expected 
uh -huh. that it's more associated be because it shares these phenotypic Correct. findings. But in this uh, patient group um, that we analyzed, we didn't see a strong effect yet, but the numbers were quite small. They were small enough, yeah. but, but it yeah. was not obvious. This is a, a, you know, almost a half a mnemonic sign of homozygous chromosome 10. Yeah. You definitely yeah. saw both 1 and 10. Yeah. So we saw that ARMS2 polymorphisms um, yeah. were more common in this phenotype, but it was not a really strong finding that we would have expected. Um, so this trickling phenotype uh, compared to other GAs showed a uh, differential um, AMD risk score. Uh -huh. So there, there is something different, and actually maybe you saw it, I put quotation marks on trickling AMD because, you know, what is AMD? And I, I'm not sure if you would, could, should call it AMD, maybe it's more a syndrome. Um, yeah, so there's many more to study. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating though. This is great work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Paul. A uh, very quick question. As you know, with geographic atrophy, there are now trials where we're doing anti-complement inhibitors in there, and it's actually increasing the neovascularization. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, on that, that, that C3, that yeah. whole C3, isn't that fascinating? Yeah. C5. Yeah. C5, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that, there's the discussion out that maybe by inducing C... So, so in this uh, Philly trial, the phase three is right now uh, running in the phase two trial. There was a significant decrease in GA progression in the treatment group. But there was also a significant increase in CNV lesions. And so there is one hypothesis that maybe by, by this compound, um, CNV was um, increased, so the evolution of CNV was increased in this uh, treatment group, and maybe this protected from faster GA progression. But I think we still need to see what's coming out. So I know that there was an analysis, uh, a retrospective analysis done, and obviously some saw already at baseline CNV lesions in this treatment group. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting hypothesis, but I think we still need to learn more about this.